You can be demanding without being demeaning. Like just because you come in late doesn't mean I'm gonna MF you up and you know up and down. It just means that you came in late. We all agreed that we'd be on time. That's not cool. You showing up late is taking lunch off of my plate and I'm not gonna let you do that because I care about the team and I care about you. And when you can create collective accountability where everybody's willing to do that with each other, you've got something incredibly special. Brad Lee back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs. Today in the studio, I've got a dude of all dudes. Used to freaking coach basketball. Took a few teams from zero to hero, and now he's blessing us with his presence. Alan Stein Jr., welcome to the show. Thanks, brother. Ace Steezy, ready to drop some beezies. Well, that is freaking exciting. Only because the bombs haven't been flowing lately oh they haven't no let's change that the button's been broken has it yep but it's working now uh, so as you know if you listen to the podcast at all i do then i am the bomb dropper <laughs> i am however going to get guests a bomb they can yeah i was going to well. say i'm looking around at my desk i don't see anything i can press here so i'm going to trust you everybody keeps requesting it and i'm like okay okay I'll, I'll get a bomb you can drop. It might sound more like a fart, but, you know, <laughs> I'm definitely going to give you guys a bomb you can drop. I love it. So, Alan, you were a coach of what? Give me a little history. Some of the Bomb Squad listeners may or may not have heard of you, but I want to give the benefit of the doubt to all the people that have not. And I want to, and I don't want to butcher your story. Tell me about your background. You know, I'm under the impression most of them haven't heard, and I love that. I like swimming upstream and going uphill. So, uh, yeah, I was actually a basketball performance coach. So I handled the strength and conditioning, the fitness and the athleticism of the players I worked with, uh, and I specialized mostly at the youth and high school level. Okay. Um, but I come from Washington D.C., and and that's one of the probably top three or four areas for youth and high school basketball in the whole country. Why and is we, that? You think? You know, I don't know. There's something in the water but we've produced some really, really exceptional players over the last 15, 20 years. Are there a lot of tall kids there? There are a lot of tall kids. Well, and of there's... course, there's a lot of tall kids everywhere, but I think the, the, the D.C. metro area, for whatever reason, there's also some really good coaching in that Yeah, but area. you know what's crazy about D.C.? There's no tall buildings. No, that's very true. Why is that? I have no idea. Because people would probably try and drop bombs and knock them down. Oh, be my guess with the, with the government there yeah it's interesting they don't want to be what, an easy target yeah when i went there i'm like dude why is why are there no tall buildings here they're no. all little that's why the washington monument sticks out and it's not even that big interesting all right so you're from the dc area there's a lot of talent around there and you produce talent how long since you've stopped doing this so two years ago i made the leap over to the corporate side but for almost 20 years i was working at the high school level uh there's two schools there in particular uh, montrose christian which is where kevin durant graduated from ah, and then uh, did you know him i did yeah he was he was one of my players wow and then uh, dematha catholic high school which has been good for the last 50 years and and we've had a few nba all-star level players from there as well um and, and that's what kind of led me uh, to get some gigs with nike and with jordan brand and with with usa basketball so i got a chance to observe and watch the best of the best as well as work with many of the best players when they were back in high school wow any coincidence that they're that they're religious faith-based schools you know, no, not that I know of. You know, it's it's interesting in the D.C. area. Uh, it's a very private school heavy area when it comes to athletic talent that, yeah. you know, the, the public schools get diluted really quick because most of the players choose to go to private schools. And it's been my experience. Most private schools are faith based of some sort. Yeah. And I was always, you know, where I was driving with that is like, you know, you have to sometimes invest in people. And private schools have a little more money than public schools. Yes. And it's just coincidence that, you know, private schools always have the best programs. You notice that? Yeah. Like here, my kids go to a school. Well, they have another school that they have. It's called Finley Prep. I'm very familiar with Finley. Dude, every kid on that fucking team is like 10 feet tall. I'm thinking, where are they getting all these tall ass kids? Like, yeah. it's impossible to find them all just happen to be in the right neighborhood. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, I realized, oh, they go out and find <laughs> and invest like they want all the basketball stars coming to that place. Yes. Very few of the Finley kids that play on the basketball team are. And Finleys lost. are tall. Oh, yeah. Like the actual Finley family. Yeah, they're they tall. I think that's what attracted them to the game in the first place. Interesting. But that so, team's pretty eclectic. They bring in kids from all over the world to play when they lure them, prep. And they lure them with the private school. Like Absolutely. They, so, so back in high school, what's the... 
you know, hey, I'll buy you a car. Is there any of that going on? Uh, I'm sure there is. You know, it's what's interesting, you know, at a program like DeMatha, where I was most recently, you know, we have such a high track record of kids going on and playing Division One basketball and then going on to the NBA that you don't need to do anything to attract the top talent. Mm-hmm. It attracts itself. They want to come play at DeMatha. You know, DeMatha is led by Coach Mike Jones, who's one of the finest coaches that I've ever been around at any level in any sport. And kids want to come play for him because yeah. they know they'll leave four years later best prepared to, you know, fulfill their dreams of playing basketball at college and in the NBA. So, you know, DeMatha doesn't have to recruit near as much as people are recruiting themselves to come. Yeah. I like, you know, when I was a kid, I was good at sports, but no one really to coach and mentor me. My, my dad wasn't really one of those parents that did that. But basketball was quick. I don't like garden people. And when I did play, I was in junior high. And I freaking stole the ball out of the hands of the opponent. Everyone started cheering. I got so excited. I ran down, did a layup, made the basket, turned around, and realized it was the wrong basket. Oh, man. And the whole school was right there watching. Remember, oh. remember, remember in schools where the whole assemblies <laughs> oh, yeah. and shit? Absolutely. The whole school was there watching. Did that ruin your street cred, or did you have enough cred you were okay? You could shoot at the wrong hoop, and everybody still liked you? Nope. Like you were, you were I, done. I quit. And, <laughs> oh, I, and, and again, I quit like a dumbass. And I didn't have any coaching and mentoring to say, bro, don't quit. Come on, man. Right. This, this shit happens. The coach didn't even do it. Wow. But I wasn't really that good at basketball. I mean, I was no star at basketball. Um, and I hated guarding people. And you have to guard people. Yeah. So that's, that that's that. half the game. Yeah. And then wrestling. I went out for wrestling until some dude smeared my face in his armpit. And I'm yeah. like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> and so I quit that. And plus you had to wear those stupid leotard looking outfits. Absolutely. And then I found baseball and football. So those were my sports. Well, it's good. You tried some other things, figure out what didn't work before you found what stuck. Yeah, I did track too. Did pretty good at track. But so, football and baseball was my thing. Never really got into basketball. I don't watch basketball. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not a basketball fanatic. But gotcha. a lot of people are. What drew you to basketball? You know, I, it was my first identifiable passion. I mean, I remember being five or six years old and, and falling in love with the game. And, you know, of course, I'm 43, so I'm right in the primetime age of the, the torch being passed from, you know, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson to Michael Jordan when I'm a child. So, you know, and Jordan basically changed not only basketball, but, you know, the culture uh, of sport. Um, so I think that probably drew some some into it but there was something about the game one of the things I always liked about basketball was it was something I could go out and practice by myself I didn't need anybody else all I needed was a ball and a hoop and I could get better but then you actually won by being a good teammate and by by being someone that was of service to others so I I like that dynamic you know some of the other sports you know baseball and football depending on what position are hard to practice by yourself. Like totally. You need someone to throw you the ball at the very least or someone to block. Uh, so there was something about basketball that, that I, I liked that a certain amount of it was up to me to go out and make myself the best player I could be and then use that within the confines of the team. Yeah. I like that. So, so obviously you did very well at these schools and now you're like, listen, I'm going to jump to corporate world and teach people how to be teams, teach, teach people mindset of winning, what made you want to do that? I was just ready for a change. You know, after 20 years of serving uh, youth and high school players and coaches, I was just ready to do something different. And Not, not only that, you, th- there isn't much money in that, is there? No, there's not a lot of money into it. No. Yeah. Even, even, if, even if you are at an elite private school that, that will step up and pay their coaches even more, yeah, it's but still it's, not a lot. No, it's still not from a, a revenue driving standpoint. So were you tired of being broke? That was not the number one driver. I mean, I'm not going to say that money doesn't motivate me. It certainly does. And that factored into the equation, but it wasn't the number one reason that I made the change. You just got tired of helping kids. I, I was just ready to do something different. You know, part of it, <laughs> it, it I love the way you say that, it, it, it had to do with my own development. You know, as I'm sure you can appreciate, if you spend all of your time around teenage boys, they're not doing much to teach me about the world and about perspective. And yeah. now that, that I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm finding myself rubbing elbows with people like yourself and people in the business world, I'm learning just as much as I'm sharing. Yeah. So even when I go speak, 
I'm leaving with a whole bunch of knowledge bombs that I've learned from other people. And that's something that really excites me. So I'm finding that my own personal and professional development has been ramped up tenfold since I decided to make this switch. And, Interesting. and I've also learned, you know, a lot of these principles that I learned, I almost started taking them for granted. And I, I work with some, some elite level companies now, and I'm shocked at how much dysfunction they have that, that, that they don't necessarily have clear roles on their team and that their meetings are chaos. And that's a lot of stuff I just took for granted being around, you know, uh, coaches that really understood, you know, how to create a, a winning type culture. So I'm, I'm thankful for an opportunity to be able to share these kind of nuggets with, with those groups. Yeah. When you say clear roles in meetings, do you, do you find that most companies are like that? Cause I, I do like, I talk to a lot of people and you know, I always say clarity is gold in a world of chaos. Yes, it is. And meetings, which is funny that you say that because I'm coming out with a product called killermeeting.com. Mm -hmm. If you go to killermeeting.com, you'll see it. It's not up yet, but it'll be up soon. And killer meeting is literally a system that if you put on a lot of meetings, this will have all type kinds of meetings, quick, easy, good killer meetings that will show you how to facilitate a quick, good killer meeting because most meetings I've noticed usually do the opposite. And when you said they don't have clear roles, they have chaotic meetings. What did you mean? That's exactly what I meant. I, I wish I could find a statistic on how much time is actually wasted in meetings. I like and, statistics. I know you do. And, and, and there's just too many meetings in general. I mean, some people hold meetings to plan the next meeting and it's like, there has to be something more efficient that we could be doing. And, and, you know, I pull a page out of my basketball, uh, playbook, you know, a, a coach at the beginning of a game is only given a finite number of timeouts and those timeouts are brief by design, They're either 30 or 90 seconds. So uh, they don't have the luxury of calling a timeout whenever they want or holding a meeting with the team whenever they feel like it. You only get a few of them, so you have to use them wisely. And you have to be brief by design because that's how long the timeouts are. And you best share something with your team that's going to put them back out on the court, you know, uh, more apt to succeed. And I think businesses should follow a similar model. Like, hey, don't pretend we can have meetings whenever we want. There you go. There you go. Fire we got. I don't know how far we are in, but I was waiting for that. Thank you, sir. There you go. Well, uh, they, well that's because I agree wholeheartedly. Too many companies are having too many meetings, first of all. Second of all, when you do have them, they're long and yes. they're freaking pointless. And when you walk in, you have an agenda. Yes. But when you walk out, it usually is the opposite of what you were trying to accomplish. Hence, my new invention, Killer Meeting. Exactly. No, I, want, I look, I look I want, forward to checking that out. Well, I want people, well, maybe you can help me create get, it get it out there absolutely because at the end of the day it's just a it's just a library of killer meetings right to where the individual at company a doesn't have to be a meeting planning expert right this will be a meeting in a box kind of thing exactly where i got some some interesting and and unique things about it which will make it popular but at the end of the day there's a lot of meeting companies out there making a fortune just planning meetings right but from a day-to-day -day, it you know you, those are few and far between, you know, you got to plan them, you know, the, right. How about just the daily meetings people are having? Well, th those are the ones that are the major time suck. I mean, imagine if I, if I came into light speed and said, you get three meetings this week or three meetings this month, that's all you get, Brad. So you better figure out how and when you want to use those. Oh, and by the way, when you have them, there's a 20 minute time limit on each. And not only is there a 20 minute time limit, there needs to be an invite list. And the only people that are in the meetings are those that need to be there. We don't need this big corral of people. And half the people are sitting in the meeting going, why am I here? Someone could give me a PDF with the bullet points from this meeting. This is, this is a colossal waste of my time. So why would people be in the meeting? What makes them necessary in a meeting? You could do that to anybody. Well, it would just depend. I mean, it would, it would imagine the agenda of the meeting. What's the purpose of this meeting and who needs to have direct input? You know, so if you and I were going to have a meeting about how to create killermeeting.com, then who else besides you and I would need to be a part of this meeting? Who else would, would be able to add input to this? And if we decide that it's just you and me, then it's just going to be you and me meeting. We don't need to have anybody else in the room, but so many groups would have 20 people in this room, even though you and I are the only ones that need to actually have any input. And that's wasting 18 other people's time. So are meetings generally best utilized by input? Because sometimes I'll call meetings to tell people things. It's not input, it's output. And I want them all in one room so I can answer your questions and make sure that you guys understand what's cracking. For sure. Is that a good reason for a meeting? 
Oh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's, and this isn't about me coming from a place of judgment of what's good and what's bad. That's for you Let as the leader to decide. Well, I'm telling you, I'll judge the world and the world has mostly <laughs> shitty meetings. Yes. And too many of them. And I've and too many of them. And I've been in good ones where when you leave, it's like you're fired up. You're, I mean, they, whoever did it hit the mark, but usually those meetings that make you feel that way are like freaking structured. They're like, the, yes. like some, somebody went through a lot of time to think through it. Yes. And like, you don't have in a day to day world, the time to think through a bunch of sales meetings. Then there's people having sales meetings just, just because there's a box to check. Did you have a sales meeting today? Right. So I'm trying to figure out, especially cause it sounds like you're the expert. What, why do you have a meeting? What What's a good reason to have a meeting? I have meetings like I want everyone to hear this directly so there's no, you know, diluted bullshit. And then I'll go in there with thinking, you know, we're going to be here five minutes. I'm going to go bing, bing, bing. And then we find ourselves belaboring certain issues, saying the same shit three different ways, which is now confusing people, yep. um, you know, intimidating people, threatening people, you know, because now you get passionate. And you guys better understand this because if this right. gets fucked up, we got issues. And now you just basically shat on the people in the meeting. Good use and, of the past tense. And dude, it, at the end of the day, it's like, dude, you would have probably better off not having a meeting at all. Right. Well, what What's you just, good? but what you just said there, you said, I mean, that was so insightful. You should never hold a meeting if there's not a distinct purpose for holding the meeting. If you can't, you know, say at least in a, in a clear sentence or a couple of bullet points, the reason that you're having the meeting and what is the outcome that you're looking for? What do I want these people to be able to do differently when they leave this meeting? If you can't answer that, then you probably shouldn't have the meeting in the first place. So there needs to be something that they completely understand. This is the reason. Here's why we're going to the meeting. This is what Brad wants us to do. Here's why I'm actually invited to the meeting, whether it's for me to hear something or for me to share something, but I know crystal clear why I'm there and here's an agenda that, and, and I know if we have an agenda and Brad sticks to it, he's unconsciously telling me that he respects my time because if he doesn't, if you just bring people in and everybody's talking and it's a free for all, then no one's being respectful of anybody else's time. Yeah. So now I'm coming into the meeting. I know exactly what we're going to talk about. I know the reason we're having it and I know what I'm going to need to be able to do differently when I leave this meeting. And sometimes that'll take eight minutes. Sometimes it might take 90, but at least we know that every minute has been invested into something that's trying to get us where we're trying to go. And that's, that's where I see a lot of folks, they're not doing that. And that's why I like this, this timeout comparison, you know, and, and, and novice coaches will call timeout. Okay. So the, clearly our team's not playing well. I call timeout. I sit you down, Brad, and I, I, you know, get in your face and scream at you for 75 seconds about how poorly you're playing. And you know how poorly you're playing. I don't need to tell you that. And now the buzzer goes off and I send you back out on the court and I've done nothing to empower you so that you'll play better now. All I did was rehash the past. Mm -hmm. That's a colossal waste of a meeting Point or in this case, obvious. a timeout. Yes. So instead, let's call a timeout. Let me be incredibly succinct and brief and tell you guys exactly what it is that I need you to do different. And then I want you leaving in the emotional state of how I want you to enter the next thing, which would be the game. So I don't want you going back into the game with less confidence, which is what you'll have if I just scream and yell at you when you come out. Yeah. So same thing. You've got to think, what's the emotional state I want my team to be in when they leave this meeting? And you make sure that you end on that high note. You know, you end with a good close so that they leave going, all right, we're feeling good. Now, if the meeting is you need to reprimand some people, you don't like the way things are headed. That's okay too. It doesn't mean everything needs to be, you know, puppy dogs and ice cream. It just means everything needs to be intentional. Nothing in a meeting. And of course you're going to go off script every now and then, but you need to plan meetings because that's how you'll get the most out of them. And that's how you're being respectful of everybody's time. Yeah. Good point. Now, most people miss that. Why is that? They're not coaches. Mm, you know, one of the worst answers I think anyone can ever give to any question is, well, that's the way it's always been done. And, and I think I, that I hear that a lot. By I way. hear that a lot as well. That's one of the reasons I enjoy going into the corporate world, even though I don't have a lick of corporate experience. I use that as to my advantage because I go into a company and say, I'm not going to tell you the way things have always been done. I'm going to come in with a fresh perspective and shake things up and do things differently. Yeah. You know, but I think that people think, well, you know, when I was the VP here, we always held meetings and this is what we did. We have the month, you know, the, the Monday morning staff meeting is just the way we do things here. And no one's taken a second to step back and go, do we even need this Monday morning meeting? What's the point of it? Just because we've been doing it for five years doesn't mean it's of value. And I think that's why a lot of people do a lot of things in their lives. It's the way it's always been done and they don't take time to question it. 
so when so when a business brings you in, do you like you're not going to be known as the meeting guy? No, that's just one this of the just, things. Yeah, you're this talking is just about. one little teeny thing. That, but so, it often comes up when we when they want me to look at at leadership and effectiveness and building a culture. If your meetings are draining the life out of your people, that's eroding your culture. You're ruining your culture by holding a meeting. And I know that everyone has good intentions. No one's intentionally holding a meeting to ruin their culture, but you're doing that by default. Yep. I think I've done it around here in time or two. Everybody Maybe has. every time. But now, is, you, now which, you'll rethink it. Which is counterproductive. Yes. Yeah. So when you walk into a, a, a business, where do you start? Like the reason I'm asking is because... You know, I've got a lot of people with startups. I got a lot of people with businesses that are listening to this podcast. It's crazy, by the way, how many people listen to this podcast. I know. I'm like, I'm holy one of them. I'm one of them, baby. Well, thank you. But I'm like, holy shit, man. I just got a couple of microphones. I chit chat with people. And now all of a sudden it's like getting crazy popular. And they keep saying it's because, you know, you're just having a real conversation. It's almost like we're sitting in the living room with you guys listening and, you know, you keep shit real. Yes. Which I appreciate. And so, so thank the bomb squad. And, and if you're in it, that's awesome. I, I thank am you. in the bomb squad. So, so the reason I ask is because there's a lot of people in the bomb squad that have businesses. So I want you to tell me like if they can't afford you, cause you, you're working with some big companies, the big people pay you to come in big money. And I'm sure you help, you know, companies smaller too, but Let's say some people are out there, they got a little company, but they can't afford Alan Stein Jr. prices for now yep. until they grow a little bit. How Give them some free shit that you would do. Don't tell them what to do. Tell them what you would do if someone just paid you big money and walked into an organization. Do you have a checklist? Do you have where you start, where you go, and what you're trying to accomplish? What are you trying to do when you when you get paid big bucks? Let's say I said, okay, I'll pay whatever fee. Come on in here. First day, you're going to do something. You're going to walk through a process, I'm sure, and then we're going to get to a result. Talk about that. Absolutely. Well, of course, the very first thing I'll do before I even set foot here is I'm going to be the, the best active listener I can be. And I'm going to ask you every question that I can think of that, that's going to help give me with clarity what the sticking points are. What's the issue here? Where Where is the thorn in your paw? And let's figure that out first because I don't want any surprises. Uh, but I've got uh, what I call a success flow. Um, it goes identity standards, accountability, culture, and results. And I'll unpack each of those. The, the very first thing that a company needs to know and have great clarity, and this is not just you at the top. This is all the way down to whoever would be the lowest on the proverbial uh, totem pole. This could even be the building service staff. What is the identity of this business? Why are you in business? What is your purpose? Like, what do you believe? Why do you expect your team to make sacrifices? You know, what problems do you solve? Who are you serving? You know, and, and really have with great clarity, what is the identity of the existence of this business? And even that alone, you take a business with a hundred people in it and you ask each of them to write down, what's the identity of this business? What exactly do we do? What problems do we solve? Why are we here? And in a, in a company of a hundred people, you'd be shocked how many different answers you get. Now, if you're at the top, you're the founder, you're the CEO, you probably have tremendous clarity with the identity, but what about the other 99 people? Have you effectively communicated that to them? Do they know? And do they know how their role fits into that? What so, do we do? What problems do we solve? Who do we solve them for? Like who is our target? What do we believe? What do we value? All of these pillars and, and your identity is really a healthy combination of all of these things. It's, it's, there's not necessarily a set checklist of what to ask, but this, it's important for these people to know this is the identity of this business. And then once you've created an identity, now you need to create standards to uphold that identity. So this is what you believe. This is the problem you solve. This is who you solve it for. These are your values. Now we need to have some standards that everyone in this room needs to live up to in order to uphold that identity. You know, the old school style of leadership was top down, which means you're at the top, you come up with a list of rules and you tell all of us to follow them. And if we don't, then we need to find somewhere else to work. Word. A better way to do that is to actually collectively create standards, something that people know that if we live up to these standards, we will live out this identity to the best of our ability. So perfect example might be, let's say we're sitting in here with 10 people that make up the light speed team and say, do we all believe that being on time for company functions is important? 
And if everyone says yes, well, then that's going to be a standard that we're going to live by. Everybody here what knows. What if someone says no? Then one, you want to be, you want to be able to listen to them and, and get some clarity. Well, why do you think being on time is not important? And see what they have to say. Now, I use this example. Well, because if the job gets done, who cares what time I walk in the door? Fair enough. But if we're talking about actual company functions, if we're no, going I know, to- but I, like I, this is what I'm hearing. So I'm trying to like ask you, like if I just paid you big money, I'd be yeah. asking you this because guess what? I don't understand the whole they get to decide bullshit. Like okay. if, if I oh, you're talking about when you like the consensus of the group. Yeah. Like if I if I invest all this time and money building the company, you come to work here. I'm not I, I don't necessarily need to ask you if you think it's OK that we're here on time. I, I think I should be or the leader should be. The person that gets to decide, hey, we are going to be on time. Now, you just said, well, you know, you ask them, is this something? Okay, then it's going to be something. Well, what if they say no? Because if because if they're going to say no, why ask them at all? Because I don't give a fuck. Like, right. hey, you're going to be on time. Why? Because I said so. That's why. But in reality, I don't, I don't, I'm not against giving some, you know, open voting, you know, process. I'm just wondering why, what's the benefit? Because then- they're just going to, I mean, dude, if I say, Hey, are we going to give pay raises every day or every month? Of course they're going to say every day they're self-serving, right? I'm going to do shit. I'm self-serving. People are self-serving. Yes. How do you get them to tell you real feedback? And when do you not care? Cause like showing up on time in my mind as an employee, if the job gets done, who gives a fuck? You don't pay me hourly. Who cares if I'm here one hour or we're 40 hours. If I walk in at 8.15 and do a better job than the person that's showing up at 8, what's more important? Well, clearly in that case, 8.15. But some point in time, you have to have order. Yes. You have to have ex expectation. I want you here at 8 o'clock because that's what I expect you to be here. So now I can start planning my day and I know you'll be here at 8. You will be here at 8. Not, would you like to be? Right. What do y'all think? Should we make that a standard? I love it. And I, I think I did a poor job communicating because I made it sound too soft and too touchy feely. It's yeah. a couple of things. You make it One, sound like we all want to play hacky sack and discuss the future. Yes. No. And it's and it's not quite that. People will always give you more buy in and more believe in and more commitment if they feel that they have a say in what's going on. So yeah, part of it is, sure. is simply asking them and make th them feel that way. Yes, exactly. It doesn't mean that you absolutely have to do what it is that they're saying. It's more that you care enough about them to ask their opinion. You as the leader ultimately are going to be the one that decides which standards stick. This is not a full democracy. And I, that's where I did a bad job uh, communicating yeah, but I'm, that, but it, I'm guilty. See, I'm guilty. That's why I'm asking it. Cause I'll walk into a meeting and I'm, I want to try to act like that. Right. But in reality, I don't. I'll walk in and I'll say, hey, folks, we're going to be here at 8 o'clock. And then I've tried the whole, what do you all think? Is that fair? And then someone would say something that makes sense and you can't argue with it. Like, what does it matter? No, that's a good and, point. And then I don't know how to argue with it. So then I just become a dick. Like, it doesn't fucking matter. Like, you'll be here at 8. And then, again, that's why those meetings, like I always say, backfire for companies. They can, yes. Because I went in there just to fire them all up and they all left thinking, oh, he's a dick. Like, I tried to get their input. What do y'all think? Is that is that fair? And then someone made a good reason why it technically doesn't make any sense at all. And then instead of somebody having the ability to um, change, most people will just turn into a dick. Yeah. Like, dude, I don't care what you think. You're going to be here at 8 o'clock. When in reality, the true finesse is when you get that information and then you get them to want to believe that being on time is important. Yes. That's, that's, that's finesse. Yes. You got to be like a skilled leader that takes practice just like basketball without question. But I know that we're probably stuck too much on the one about time. I'm with you hundred percent that as long as the job gets done and it gets done, done to an elite level, when you do it is probably irrelevant. But I also think that being on time for certain things is a respect of time. So if you were, if you were going to have a super big time guest in, you've got your buddy Grant Cardone coming in to sit in this seat right here and your film guy decides to show up 30 minutes late, that's not going to fly. So him just coming in whenever he wants is probably not going to work. So when you have a scheduled engagement, Grant's coming in here, you're going to interview him. This guy better be here on time or it's disrespecting your time and it's disrespecting Grant's time. Uh, but more. Well, to me, to be on time, you're early. For sure. Absolutely. Preparation is key. Love it. 
But from a macro level, it's important that you have to realize that you're always going to view the company through your lens, which yeah. may be the founder or the, the, the CEO, where other people in different departments and at different levels are going to have different vantage points. And by merely asking them their opinion on certain things, lots of times you'll get some tremendously valuable information that might change your perspective or how you view it. So if this is not a everybody raise their hand if they want to be on time democracy. This is let me hear some thoughts from some places that I don't get to see as often and let me see if what they have to offer is valuable. But ultimately, you're the one that will decide the standards. But I'm telling you that just the mere fact of asking someone unconsciously, they leave going, wow, Brett. Brad values what I think. He just asked me about some of these standards and I shared with him. Regardless of whether you change any of your positioning or not, I feel like you truly care about me as a person simply by the fact that you asked. Yeah. And that is a glue that will, you know, instead of eroding a culture like a lot of these meetings do, this will actually help bind your culture. Yeah. So now you have these standards and then the standards, once they're set and effectively communicated, that's when we move to accountability. And the key for a, an organization to be successful is not just having vertical accountability, it's having horizontal accountability, which means everybody holds everyone accountable, which means well, that's like a dream scenario. And it, absolutely. But that's what we're aiming for, right? Can I mean, you help companies achieve that without question. And it starts by, first of all, laying, clarity, laying a clarity. Absolutely. And laying a foundation of trust and getting people to understand accountability is not something you do to them. It's something you do for them. See, many people think that if you're holding me accountable, and we, we see this whether it's, it's, it's father to son or it's CEO to employee, that if you're holding me accountable, like, why is Brad always busting my chops? Why is he always getting on me? Because he cares. When you hold someone accountable, you show them that you care about them and you care about the organization. So what I would like to see, and we'll keep going back to time, even though it might not be the best example, if we have 10 people from Lightspeed in here that we're all supposed to be at this meeting, and we know that one of our standards is we will be early, because if we're not early, we're late, and someone comes in five minutes late, every single person in this room needs to hold that person accountable to the fact that they just violated one of the standards. Because if we allow them to violate any standard, no matter how small it may seem, then we're going to start to erode our identity. So we're working back down the chain now, and, and that's where things get busted. But you can hold someone accountable through love. You can be demanding without being demeaning. Like just because you come in late doesn't mean I'm going to MF you up and, you know, up and down. It just means that you came in late. We all agreed that we'd be on time. That's not cool. You showing up late is taking lunch off of my plate and I'm not going to let you do that because I care about the team and I care about you. And when you can create collective accountability where everybody's willing to do that with each other, you've got something incredibly special. I wish. Like, how do you get that achieved? Well, one, it's, it's making sure that everybody knows that their voice is being heard. And this one is, is also incredibly challenging. And I'd love your perspective on it. It takes humility and vulnerability from the leader at the top because you aren't above the standards either, which means if you, Brad Lee, show up five minutes late, your team needs to be able to have the courage to hold you accountable. And if you've created a safe and fertile environment, a safe culture, then they'll be willing to do that. I'm going to be willing to say, Brad, dude, you were five minutes late, man. Come on. That's not cool. And I'm not worried that you're going to fire me over it. I know that you want me to hold you accountable because that's the culture you've created. And that's, that, that would can be, be nice. tough. Well, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, not absolutely. only that, finding people to care. Like you, you, you know, in a company where people actually care, would be beautiful. Like I think Lightspeed to a point is like a unique company, and then in some cases, you know, we're just like the rest of them. But in most cases, fortunately, we step it up. We do care. We do try, you know, and uh, try to m mitigate as much, you know tomfoolery as possible but i've seen it to where like certain employees won't tell on other certain employees because their friendship right and their camaraderie is more important than the mission the company the vision the rules and the accountability to where it's like i find something out and i go hey why wouldn't you say something oh dude i don't want to be labeled the narc right so their own relationships are usually are more important than some of these things. How do you fix that? Well, again, and that sometimes it can be hard to undo. A lot of this is how you would uh, especially start with new hires and making sure that they understand. Uh, that would be an example of confrontation. Yeah, but you, euphoria is when all your employees 
you know, equally care like they own a piece of the company. Because a lot of times yes. you get bigger and they don't give a rat's dick. Right. I'm not going to tell on Joey that that's 10 minutes back from lunch late. Then I'm the dick. So, and not only that, we hang out after work and he won't give me a dime bag, you know, when we're playing <laughs> Call of Duty or whatever. So, in a lot of companies, most companies, the employees are just there for a paycheck. Yes. There is no strong culture. By the way, every company has a culture. It's yes. Good or bad is the crazy. Exactly. But you see what I'm saying? Like, how do you get people to buy into your shit so deeply that someone really is self-policing? And like, when you show up late, I really do give a shit. And I give a shit so much, I don't care if we're not friends anymore. Like, that to me is like some euphoric, uh, you know, ideological yeah. outcome that I've never seen in any business. And and that would be absolutely ideal and perfect. And we realize that no business is going to be able to do that 100% of the time with 100% of the people, but we're still trying to, to mitigate that gap as much as possible. Yeah. So it happens less often and with less people. Uh, you brought up a couple of really great points. One, it's important people know there's a difference between liking and caring. You know, you and I don't have to like each other personally but we do have to care about each other and we have to care about this business. You know, caring is an act of will. Caring is a choice. If you and I decide that we don't want to go grab beers after work, that's okay. That can't get in the way of us being able to do our jobs and fulfill our role to the best of our ability. So one, we need to make sure that people know that if you and I are boys and you come in late, me not holding you accountable means that I don't care about this business, that I don't care about the company or the identity or everybody else on our team because I'm willing to let a standard slide based on my own personal relationship. And, and we need to encourage folks not to take that route. That, hey, first well, of all, how, though? <laughs> if, if, if you and I are boys, you know, and I understand the concept of kind of narking and ratting somebody out, but if you and I are boys, you're putting me in an awkward position by showing up late. But like, why? What do I, what do you, what do you give a shit? I'm 10 minutes late. Doesn't affect your job at all. Well, that's where it comes to the next point that you made in order for this to really reach true euphoric levels. You need to tie everyone in the organization to that identity so that they actually feel a little bit of pain when that's happening. So let's say uh, you have a certain revenue goal. And if you reach this revenue goal, everyone gets a certain bonus. Well, if I if you can prove to me that my buddy showing up 10 minutes late is going to take a few steps in the wrong direction to us reaching the revenue goal, then ultimately he is taking lunch off of my plate. Him coming in 10 minutes late and not making the two sales calls he was supposed to make is actually going to limit the ability for us to reach the goals and for me to get my bonus. So there, there actually is a problem there. And I know that that example may be a tad over dramatic, but the key is tying everybody to that identity. And in order for, for folks to truly care, they have to believe that their role matters regardless of what their role is. And if you've got the right people on the bus, you need to make sure you put them in the right seat by making sure that their role is not only what they like to do, but it's also what they're really good at. You know, if most of the people here at Lightspeed are doing things that they're naturally good at and they enjoy doing, they're going to give you a much better effort. It's when you have people doing things that they're not very good at or don't like doing, that's when we have some of this problem. So part of the reason your boy shows up 10 minutes late anyway is because he probably doesn't feel a real strong connection to the identity and he doesn't really feel great about his role. That's why he doesn't care if he's 10 minutes late. You care because this is your baby, which is why you're early everywhere you go, which is why you have high enthusiasm everywhere you go, which is why you're all in with everything you do because this thing is your baby. Your goal as the leader is to try to get as many people on the team to feel as close to that as possible. Yeah. Well, I like the, what you said about <clears throat> clarity because as you're talking, I'm thinking. I'll do that a lot. That's a, it's a good practice to get into, brother. So sports and team is the equivalent of business and employees. Yes, absolutely. So your business is the sport. Your employees is the team. Basketball, in, in your context, is was your sport. Mm -hmm. Your team were the kids. Yes. Now, And you're the coach in right. this analogy. Well, maybe, maybe, but let me, let me walk you down this oh, please. or, or as, uh, as people say, unpack it. <laughs> now the, I'm looking at the differences. The difference is because ideally they, they work, but not actually in some cases. And, mm -hmm. and, and our job as an entrepreneur is to make it work because ideally you want like a team. Now in basketball, everyone wants to win. In business, 
that's not necessarily true. So there you want to, you, so I'm going through my mind. So one, I want to try and figure out how to get everybody to want to win, right? Because if everybody doesn't want to win, you got a problem right there. You aren't going to win shit on a basketball team if half the team doesn't want to win. Can I challenge that just for a little bit? Sure. I don't think anyone say that they wouldn't want to win, but we know how selfish we are as human beings. If you take the average high school player and say, would you rather score 30 points and lose or would you rather score two points and win? If you put them on a lie detector test, most kids would rather score 30 and lose because it's all about them. So you need to find the special players that are willing to say, I'm okay if I only score two because winning is what's most important. And you can look at any professional sports team. Look at the ones that have been the most successful historically. They've found, they've created a culture and they found coaches that bring in players that are those unique players. They're the ones that would actually rather win than be the superstar they, themselves. You say they found them. I'm trying to figure out how to create them. Create, yes. And then part of it's, yeah, part of it is it'll be the culture you create, which one of the first things I learned as a coach, there's only two things you can do as a coach or a leader. You accept it or you correct it. That's it. Accept it or correct it. And so either, And either one of them's... Um... Well, you win either way. So if you, if, if, you're, if you find out that I'm letting my boy come in 30 minutes late to lunch... Accept or correct, folks. Accept or correct. That, that's, 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 that was a paused bomb. I love it. Better late than never. So that's it. So either if you find out that I've been quietly letting my boy come in from lunch 10 minutes late, you have a choice. You either accept that that's just going to be the way it's going to be, or you're going to find a way to correct that. And that's, those are the only choices we have. Yeah, but that's the hard part. Oh, it absolutely is That's why people need to hire guys like you to come in and work with them. And and business is hard. Sure. I mean, if this was easy, everybody else would have their own thing and they'd be crushing it the way you are, but they don't. But basketball and team business and employees that's the to me that's the equivalent so yep. so if i want and again it's easier with sports like dude to coach a soccer team to a championship is easier than to build a hundred million dollar company i think why well because everybody's voluntarily there wanting to play soccer you know what i'm saying they want to win in general you know sure there's little assholes that want to be the star and they they take a loss as long as they look like the star but in general they're all there cuz they want to be they're all having fun you know they're a team and everyone knows their role and everybody wants to win yeah in general every team i've been on i want to win yep so everybody wants to win so step 1 and 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 i am saying it so you'll discuss it yes, step please. 1 I feel like if I'm trying to make those real, then my employees need to be a team that want to win. So I need to make everybody want to win. Number two. But you're saying you don't think that happens as often in business. So no, you're saying no you, because people people don't give a shit. It's not my company. I don't give a fuck. All I want is my fucking twelve dollars an hour. Like who gives a shit? Billy's late. Well, I ain't narking on Billy. Dude, he's not gonna fucking be cool with me after work. Matter of fact, a couple people might just alienate me and not let me sit with them at lunch. Like it's the same stupid shit. But so we need to get rid of Billy. Right. But my point is, is my job. If I want to equate these two my job step one make everybody want to win figure out a way to get everybody to want to win now if someone doesn't want to win and you can clearly identify them elimination absolutely so make everyone want to win that's step one in my mind as you were talking and do you have some ideas on how to do that no but that's what i'm going to be asking you yes please got it then then there's step two yep okay if these sports team business employees if we're equating those everybody wants to win on on a team number two if this is the case Everybody um, needs to know their exact role and definition. Mm, love it. And and e- expectation. Because if you want me to play first base, but you put me in center field, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't know what it is you're expecting me to do. I get the general idea, but, you know, there's no clarity. Exactly. So I need to provide clarity for each and every role. Yes. Or roles. Yes. Because, again, in my house... Shit, dude, you might be the, your role is to answer the door. And then when there's no one at the door, your fucking role is also to do the dishes until someone's at the door. Then your role is to go over there and open the door. Then your role is to go back and finish the fucking dishes. Know your role, baby. Right. So you see my point? Like there's not always just, this is my role. Look, you might have many roles. Yes. But especially in smaller startups, people are wearing lots of hats, especially the owner, the, 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 the entrepreneur. So the whole thing is you have to define the role, even if you have seven. 
I need to know what my roles are. Yes. Right? So that would be number two. And then the third observation was that those teams, when you play the next school, there's a clear opponent. Yeah. Sometimes in business, you don't know as an employee, as a team member, who the fuck's the bad guy? Who right. are we beating here? You know what I mean? Who, what, there's no competition. There's no clear, yes. I want to beat that person. So we need to identify. So you identify roles, yep. right? And then number three, I think if I'm equating the two. Yes. I need to identify our enemy, our competitor, opponent. our opponent. I need to identify our opponent. Now, if I could do that to my employees, that would create a team because the team now knows everybody wants to win. Everybody knows their position. Yep. And everybody knows the enemy, the opponent, the 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 goal, the objective. How do I do those three things? Love it. And first of all, I and love the, the way, fact that you owe, you owe me money. Yeah. I just made you billions because you're gonna freaking go into a company. <laughs> Once we talk about this, yeah. The bomb squad's listening. If you execute what he's about to tell you, your company's gonna improve for free because you listen to this podcast. Yeah. Because I'm telling you right now, the whole goal would it, it sounds easy. You know, I coached a team from zero to freaking kick ass champions. Well, if you did, everybody wanted to win. Yep. You knew everybody's position and they knew who their freaking opponent was. So if you want to make your team similar to a sports team, then I would think you have to do similar things. So I have to freaking get everybody to want to win, which is hard. Very hard. And then there's number two, because they're, they don't own the company. Correct. I don't get fuck all from this. Like, right. fuck you. Give me my $12 and shut the fuck up. I don't care. And there's a lot of that in the world. There is. So how do we identify it and eliminate it? Because a lot of people hide. A lot of people are good at... You know, acting like they're all your buddy and they give a shit and they don't give a rat's dick. And then there's some other people that they give a rat's dick, but they're just dumber than a box of rocks. They'll fuck your business up with good intention. Yeah. And you don't want them either. I don't anyway. No. And then number, uh, so you got to make them all want to win. You yep. got to clearly identify the roles and then you have to clearly identify the opponent when in some cases, you know, I'm a landscaper. Who's my opponent? The, gra know? the grass. No, I'm just kidding. But you see what I'm saying? Yes. Like in business to equate, it's kind of, you need a professional to teach us. So how would you handle those three things for a company? Love it. First of all, let's clear one thing up that a lot of people think that basic and easy are synonyms and they're not. Just because something is basic doesn't mean that it's easy. What you just, and this is a, this is a, this is a, a huge. And, and vice versa. Of course. But this is a compliment. Those three pillars that you just gave us are pure gold. They're knowledge bomb worthy and they're incredibly basic. Like I follow along with what you just said with perfect clarity. None of those things are easy and you're living proof that they're not easy. If they were easy, you'd already be doing them. Sure. So would every other business. So we all have to have the humility to realize that if we need to get back to mastering the basics and the fundamentals, but doing so is not going to be easy. Yeah. But people skip them because they think it's beneath them. That they, oh, We don't need to worry about the basics. I know for a fact that the best basketball players in the world still do the most basic footwork and offensive moves for 10 to 15 minutes of every workout in every practice. You know they, that's right. Yes, because they never get away from the fundamentals. Another thing to think about, you, you know, you've mentioned that there are a lot of people out there that say, just give me my 12 bucks. This is I'm just in it for the paycheck. I don't care about anything else. Yeah, but if they Do, said that, well, it's easy to find them. Yes. I'm talking about the people. They don't say that. But their actions are telling you. Well, Their behavior, to some degree, is showing it. Well, again, technically. Yeah. But it's not as it's not easy. Because no. I've, I'm, my leadership, I, I confused a while back with cheerleadership. Uh-huh. And cheerleader yes. is not a leader. No. It's a cheerleader, not a leader. No. To me, a leader, sometimes you have to be good at identifying What's not being said and done. Absolutely. Because in some cases, someone's trying to help out. You fire them because they fucking drop the ball. Yeah. And the, the company, other people, they know that the person volunteered and just got fired for fucking something up. Yeah. When the message that gets sent is you'll get fired if you volunteer. If you volunteer. Yes. So now everybody's like, dude, I ain't volunteering. Yeah. And then they get fired because why don't you give enough give give enough shits to volunteer well, you, so there's all these confusing messages unless somebody's clear and that takes the finesse that you mentioned earlier i mean we all know that which gets praised gets repeated well it's the same thing in the other direction if you're going to terminate somebody for not doing what they're supposed to do then then we're going to have an issue <clears throat> one thing what i'd ask you 
do you believe there are enough good people out there that are not dumber than a bag of rocks and that do care enough about something other than the $12 paycheck? Are there enough of those people out there? Yes. Yes. Well, They're all over. And in, yes. and in fact, most companies that are frustrated and think they have dumb people and think they have people that don't care have the same people that are going to give a fuck somewhere else. Yes. And they're the same people that are going to excel somewhere else. And that's why it's your fault, because th those people that you say are dumb and that you blow out and that aren't capable, they're just not capable for you. It's just like a fucking when people say she's a slut, you know, the difference between a slut and a bitch. I don't. A slut will fuck anyone and a bitch will fuck anyone but you. <laughs> that's the difference. Can you so, do a dropping bomb on that one? That's pretty. Legit. No, but it's but that's the difference. It's like people don't understand like your employees that suck and you let them go, they're going to excel somewhere else. They're going to find the right seed eventually. But they sucked for you. Well, why did right. they suck for you? Because you couldn't lead properly. You yes. couldn't identify what seat they belonged in. You couldn't nurture their talents and identify their talents and bring them to a level of success. Therefore, you should fire them. And here's here's the 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 weak part I get. Then I say, oh well, they've got kids at home, and oh well, they've got this. And rather than you know care more, yeah, you act like you care that they have kids, so you keep them, dude. You should care more that they have kids and blow them out. Why? Yes. Because you're the fucking loser that can't figure out how to lead them properly. So you should just let them go get led or find or even float into a better position. For sure. But that's where I get weak, dude. I I, I don't like terminating people because I I, I put myself in people's shoes right. i do it with a customer that's why we got the baddest training system on earth yes. if i have to use a training system i want to use light speed right and the reason for that is because i put myself in a user's position yes i put myself in employee position i put myself in other people's positions and i think it's a unique advantage it is and you actually i think on some level just answered number one for us because it was what i was going to bring up which is you have very high empathy i mean i can tell just in knowing you for a short time you have a very high emotional iq so you need to ask yourself, if I was this employee making $12 an hour, why would I care? If I'm not Bradley, the owner, if this is not my baby, I'm the employee that makes $12 an hour. Why would I care about this? What would make me care about the identity? Why would I care about making Brad another million? Why does this matter to me? If you need I wasn't to, a dick? If you No, you need to ask that. I because, already am in but, my mind. But and, the, and I'm starting to ask some qualifying questions like, oh. you mean if I'm not a dick? Because if I'm a dick, I don't give a fuck. I want my check. Son, where's my money? Right. But I then, don't give a shit. Now, if I wasn't a dick. But that's you admitting that you have a dick on your team, which comes back to you. That's no, either if accepting I was a or. Because you're proposing hypothetical. And in hypothetical, I also run through all the possibilities. So okay. there could be a possibility I was I, a dick that I my answer would be different. Yes. Now, if I was just a regular good person, what would make me care? You. Like if I liked you. Okay. You know, I, want, I don't want to let you down. I admire that's a big you. One. So therefore, I respect and admire you, and I don't want you to be let down. Therefore, I would care to do a better job, even though I'm only getting twelve dollars an hour. I right. I admire and respect you as the leader, and I want to make you look good and feel yes. good and, and think I'm cool. Well, okay, that's one reason. Let, let, let's use a hypothetical. Let's say that I work for you and I make twelve dollars an hour. Now, on one hand, I might be completely apathetic. I just want to go home and, and rip bong hits and play video games. This is only for $12. I don't care. I'm yeah. apathetic. Well, if that's the case, the moment you feel that way, you need to remove me from the team because there's no room for apathy in a Bradley organization. However, if I'm not, if I do care, here's some things I might care about. Brad is a really smart guy who can teach me skills that I can either use here or use for whatever it is that I'm trying to in the, chase in the future. Yes. In the future. Exactly. So you pouring into me and giving me new skills is a value. You're an incredibly connected guy and you know, people. So if not you, true. If you, if you and I have a conversation and you say, Alan, what is it that you want to get out of this job other than $12 an hour? What are your aspirations? Where are you trying to go? Cause I can help you get there. If you be, if you're on my team and you're committed and you buy in and play your role, even at $12 an hour, I promise you it will be the best investment you've ever made because I'm going to open doors for you and teach you skills that will allow you to fulfill your own dreams. Good one. You think if I heard that from Brad Lee, I wouldn't be all in 
at 12 bucks an hour, I'd be 100% in. That'd be nice. I might even say, Brad, keep your $12 because what you're giving me is a thousand times more valuable than money. I'm all in. Which but, would be true. But it, it, uh, of course it is. But it takes, it takes, and I know this is difficult at scale because if you have 500 people working for you, I know you can't have this conversation with 500 different yeah, people. Yeah, but you pass that down to your leaders. You definitely do. Yeah. That conversation needs to be had is literally you say, or one of your other leaders says, Alan, what's going to make you care about how well we do? What is it that you want to get out of this? We're all inherently selfish. You know, in the morning, you don't have to, when I wake up in the morning, you don't have to remind me to look out for myself. Yeah. Like I know that we're all wired to do that. Self-preservation instinct. Yes. And, and, and since we know that, well, we can't change the waves, but we can learn how to surf, which means if you already know that I'm an inherently selfish creature, then start asking me what it is that I want. What am I trying to get out of this? And once you've done that and I've told you, now you can put me in a position on the team that I'm going to be getting what I want at the same time I'm helping you get what you want. And the moment you think that I'm not, I'm apathetic and I don't care and I just want the 12 bucks, then you either accept it or you correct it. And correcting it would mean this person, we just can't have apathy on our team. Hmm, that was a good in there. Cool. But you, I mean, you led me down that because you're already doing that because you have high empathy. I'm thought provoking. You're very thought provoking. How about clear roles? Sometimes as a business entrepreneur and owner, we believe we have clear roles when in reality there's confusion amongst the ranks. Now, why is that? It's like that old game telephone. If we had 10 people in this room right now and you whispered something in my ear and I whispered it to the next person, by the time it got back to you, it would not be the original statement. If right now uh, you write down what everybody's role is in your organization, then you go to them and ask them to write down what their role is. I guarantee you there's going to be some gaps and there's going to be some differences, which just gives us the humility to realize we haven't said it as clearly as possible. Yeah, but here's what I would recommend. Tell me where I'm wrong or if I'm right. Okay. I don't try to figure out what a person person's role is i figured i try to figure out what the role is and then i try the right person yeah because it's 100 right because too many people are trying to figure out what this person's role should be listen if you had nobody at your company and you were going to start over open it up all over again Knowing what you know now, what roles would be necessary? Like, yes. shit, I need someone to freaking fix these damn lawnmowers because they break down a lot, which I didn't know, but now I do. So guess what? I need a repairman. Yes. So there's a role. Now I need, um, I also need someone to answer the damn phone because, man, yes. I, I am swamped answering the phone. So now I need a role for that. Now, you might end up creating a role that answers phones and fixes the machine. For sure. Now, now that might be a role, but... You, you don't identify, well, shit, if they're constantly answering the phone, how are they ever going to fix a machine? Now I'm going to have bad customer service because everyone's going to wonder where the fuck their machine is. Well, the dude's answering the phone because we're so busy and, and we won't have any time to fix any machines until everyone thinks we're stupid and quits calling. Yep. And then they can actually fix machines because now they're not answering the phone. But then after all the machines are fixed, the phone's not ringing and I right. just went out of business. When in reality, you should have had two distinct roles, right? Absolutely. So how do you, how do you figure out your roles? Well, I love that you started with the outcome first. We have 10 broken lawnmowers. These need to be fixed. Let me look at my team. Who on this team is the best person to fix the lawnmowers and who actually enjoys fixing lawnmowers? First of all, if they're the same person, questions, I mean, it's over. You've already answered it. This is the person that will be fixing our lawnmowers. They're good at it and they enjoy doing it. Uh, Now, what happens if there's no lawnmowers to fix or there's very few because it's a startup then that's what should they do while there's no lawnmowers well then that then that's not a role that needs to be that's not a role we need to fill there's no need in filling a role i'm paying them a salary if they're just sitting there waiting for a lawnmower to fix i'm wasting my money and they won't work on freaking on uh on uh you know what i'm talking if if Um, you on call because now they need a full-time job so you hire a lawnmower repairman and that bitch needs to get paid whether you got lawnmowers to repair or not. So but I, would I always say, say, what happens when there's no lawnmowers to repair? What should they do then? I call that a secondary post come out. Yes. Oh, and that's what you're saying. So you're saying initially we needed lawnmowers to be fixed. No, you, now, you're now in the lawnmower don't. business. You yes. know you're going to need them, but you don't need a bunch of them because you're just getting started. So right. now I have a repairman, but not a lot of lawnmowers to get repaired yet because I don't have a salesman. So but, I hire a salesman, but until it ramps up. My mechanic's just waiting. What right. should I have him do while he's waiting? I call that a secondary post. Do you recommend those or one clear role? 
No, I think there's nothing wrong with the secondary post. My question would have been, why did you hire a lawnmower repairman before you needed any lawnmowers repaired? That was an error in judgment on your end because you're paying somebody money because to, to I, fill a role that's not even there yet. Yeah, because if I wait... Then people are now okay. you, you come in to freaking get your lawnmower repaired. Now I'm out with an ad looking for a repairman. <laughs> and now there's delay and my first customer's That's pissed. Fair. So then I would say, okay, we've got Brad Jr. over here as an expert lawnmower repairman, but we don't need him to do that at present. What other needs do we have that he's capable of filling to a high level? And that will be his secondary post. That will be his, not only does he answer the door, but he also cleans the dishes. But you said it perfectly first. First, we have to establish a need. What is the role that needs to be filled? And then we either need to look on our team to who fills that to the best of their ability, or who do we go out and recruit to fill that? But there's no need in bringing someone on just bringing sand to the beach. Like if there's not a role that needs to be filled, then we don't need this person. Yeah. Or, so, a, or a, or a role that requires a full-time person. Absolutely. Interesting. And, and that clarity, there's kind of three steps to the clarity. First of all, everyone on the team needs to know their role. Yep. They have to know what it is next. You need them to embrace their role. They yep. have to understand that, you know, me, Do you ever want them to butter their role. <laughs> only only when they go out to dinner when we have a staff dinner they can butter that thing all they want i just check we, we need them to embrace it we need everyone on the team to go man my role is important to this organization because if i stop fixing lawnmowers this whole thing falls apart so i want to embrace the fact that brad trust me to fix lawnmowers i am important regardless of the 12 dollars an hour i am important and i am needed by this team that that sense of worth and value will get people to buy in it goes a long way and then you need them to star in their role this is often the hardest part because uh getting someone to star in a role that most people would consider a lesser role you know hey if your only role is to answer the door and the doorbell only rings every now and then that's not one of the biggest roles on the team. However, we need you to be the best door answerer in the world when it does ring. You have to star in your role. And we do that by rewarding great behavior. When I answer to the door like I'm an elite world-class professional door answerer, you're going to praise me up and down. You're going to tell me what a great job that I did in that one instance because then it will be repeated. And, so you want to recognize your role. Always recognize the role. And, and one thing to think, I know you said you don't follow basketball, but let me let me paint a picture for you. In the NBA, there's probably 12 players that can do a little bit of everything. You're LeBron James, you're Kevin Durant. I mean, those guys are freaks. They can do it all. Outside of the top 12 players, every single player in the NBA is a role player. They have one specific skill set that they do at an elite level and sometimes a secondary skill set but that's what they do. I could list you 10 guys right now that are elite sharpshooters. They get paid millions of dollars to catch and shoot. That's their only job, catch and shoot. I could give you another list of guys. Their entire job is to rebound and block shots. They don't care if their, their coach doesn't care if they score a point the entire game. You give me 12 rebounds a game, we'll give you 15, 20 million dollars a year. They have a very specific role. Well, here's and those guys have to fulfill that role to the best of their ability in order for the team to come together and be successful. Well, here, let me blow your mind. Please. What do you think, let's say, KD get gets paid for? To win basketball games. No. No? Okay. Some people say play basketball. Put butts in the seats? That's right. Okay. KD's a salesman. Yeah, that's... I it like always that. boils back down to sales. Yes. Like all these top athletes are not necessarily paid because they're really good athletes they're paid because they sell tickets they're entertainers which makes them sales people yeah sales is something that you need to master in Absolutely. any company even more importantly than a lot of this culture shit i know companies that are killing it and their culture's poison and everyone quits and there's high turnover but they're killing it because they're freaking selling the shit out of things yep. but imagine if you're a company out there and you get both right well, that's what I was just going to say. You, that you're playing a dangerous game. You're playing the comparison game. You're saying they're killing it because you're comparing them to somebody else, but they're not killing it to the degree that they could be killing it. That's right. So Thank they're, you. They're, they're actually sandbagging. That's right. And, and People, that's where you could say, are you successful because of your culture or in spite of your culture? In and spite. If, and if the answer is in spite, then we've got a problem. That's right. So and yes. That's, that's why people come in here like, this place is well, great, dude. You've done so well. And I say, actually, no. And they're like, quit playing humble. I'm well, like, dude, I'm not humble. I should be a billion dollar company right now i've fucked up my own shit by not knowing this stuff and 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 i'm changing it when i learn especially when the experts like you come through i take notes and then i'm like hmm, that makes sense and i start implementing so it's getting better but i can tell you if i could go back 20 years and redo this it'd take me three years to get where i am today yes in 20 
It, it'd take me three. But that's a great thing. That means you're continually learning and growing. And I hope that 20 years from now, you say the same thing. No, in three years from now, I'm going to be a billion dollar company. Three to five max. If I'm not done in five, I haven't listened to a damn thing I've been preaching. And I and that's the thing about me. I like to keep it real. I know. The real Bradley. Now, real quick, because we're hour three into this. And oh, I, really? And, and wow. I, yeah. It flew by. Oh, oh, sure. It flies by when you're talking to the old bee meister. Yeah. But, I do but, it quick, but I want to know how do you identify your clear opponent when it could be, you know, ethereal. It could be like, yes. you know, it's there's no real, it's not, oh, the, my competitor, it's not, oh, that. Like, sometimes you're doing you're doing a job and you don't feel a, an opponent or a yeah. competitor or, or any kind of clear opposition. How do you invent one or identify one? Well, like, let's say I'm a radio but, station. But part of it's what you just said. What? I think it's it's you're comparing with yourself. Your opponent is yourself. So right now, you said, uh, we're a $100 million company. That's what I was driving towards. Which, which to the average person, a $100 million company is phenomenal. You're doing great. But a $100 million company, when you're capable of being a $1 billion company, is not that good. No. So it's your opponent and is yourself. And I didn't yourself. say we're $100 because we're not $100 No, million. I'm just talking fictitiously. <clears throat> okay. Th that's what happens when we play the comparison game. Yeah. So when you say, my buddy's got a company and they're killing it, although their culture's bad he's killing it compared to some other small buildings next to his he's not killing it compared to what he could be doing if he was getting all of there this he's stuff blowing right. it that's yeah. why i was saying i was saying this yes. is don't be fooled by success they're like yes. what does that mean that's exactly what it that's means that's exactly what it is just because you're kicking ass doesn't mean you're kicking ass right you could be you killing could be kicking it. more well you could be killing it and losing you know what I'm saying? It's yes. it's perspective. If I could be making thirty billion and I'm making what I'm making, everyone would say, "Dude, he's fucking eating shit." Yeah. Well, he's doing millions of dollars. Yeah, but, but dude, he, like he's losing it. If you knew I could be a billion dollar company, but if you're a if you if you didn't even think I'd make forty million dollars, you'd be always oh, killing it. No, don't be fooled by success, folks. Just because you're kicking ass in your company doesn't mean you're actually kicking ass. Right. Assess your company, assess your team, assess yourself, and if you can, go out and freaking hire an expert like Alan Stein Jr. And by the <laughs> way, if you guys want to follow him on Instagram, it's Alan Stein Jr. on Instagram. His your website is what. AllensteinJr.com. AllensteinJr.com. Now, let me ask you a question. Sure. But I want to address what you just said, the, the clear opponent. See, I think it's a mistake trying to look for motivation by trying to find someone else to compete with you. No, you're right. Yeah, you don't need to be able to, to do that. You need to focus on yourself. Now, clearly, in a game like basketball, you, you've got to learn the other team's personnel and you want to learn their sets. But the best teams I've ever been around, they spend way more time focused on what they do and what they control than anybody else. And it's an old That's quote, right. winners, there you go. You might want to do it again because I like this one. Winners focus on winning, losers focus on winners. That's so I right. don't need to look around the room for, am I competing against Brad? Am I competing? No, I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to stay in my lane and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And if I do that, it will be good enough to beat everybody else that's around me. Yeah. Well, again, here you go. Double because time. when I wrote those down, I'm thinking through it. But when I read clear opponent, yeah. My whole thing is don't compare yourself to other people. Exactly. Compare yourself to yourself. So if you guys were out there listening going, yeah, how, who is our opponent? You are your opponent. Outdo yesterday. Every day you should be outdoing yesterday. That's your opponent. Your opponent is you. Your opponent is your potential. And your yes. opponent is your growth. And if you strive to just beat that every single day and outdo the day before, man, it's just a matter of time before you can hit that winner's belt because yes. there's no incremental growth is, is, is good. Like, in other words, you could be doing the right thing, but if you, who, what, I forget who said it, some, some, uh, fucking Rogers or some, even if you're doing the right thing, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you're just sitting there. Who said yes. that? Like, Will Rogers. Yeah, Will Rogers. You were right. Good call. Yeah. So, like, even if you're sitting on the right track and you're just sitting there, you're going to get run over. So, always outdo yesterday. Make yourself the opponent and you're going to win like a son bitch. Now, my Absolutely. question to you was Yes. You're a junior. Yes. Now, which means your dad's a senior. Yes, he is. Now, do you like being a junior? You know, well, if you could, if you could choose, would you have changed your middle name to where you got the same first and last, but nope, there's no junior attached because I've never been called junior. I'm not a junior. I call my son almost 
fucking around when I see him. You know, what's up, Junior? But I've always wondered if juniors like being juniors. Well, here, let me tell you something. Well, first of all, it, we were talking about dumb dad jokes before and, we, hit, and, we hit the record. But can I ask one more question? Yes, please. What happens if you have a kid and you make him a junior? You're he's, no longer a junior. He's the third. If I would have, I, I didn't name my son's Allen Stein. So you're still did, a junior? Yeah, you're always a junior. So you're, I'd be a daddy, but I'd be a junior because my kid would be Allen Stein the third. And what about if he had one? They'd be the fourth. And, and fifth? Yep. And sixth? And so 18th? I'll always be junior no matter what. So I'm going to be a 90-year-old junior one day. That's kind of weird. What happens if senior passes on? Well, he's going to, according, you'll ever, to, you'll according e to life. That's what But you'll happens. never be a senior? No, I'll always be junior. Yeah, it's not. I don't get a promotion. I don't go from uh, yeah junior VP to senior VP when my dad passes away. Do you like junior? If you could change it, would you change it? Well, well, here's what's funny. First of all, if you ever meet my dad, I will bet you everything that I own, which is not a ton, he makes the joke, I'm the original Alan. This is the carbon copy. He does that every time he meets anybody that I introduce him to, but uh, he still loves the joke. I always just went by Alan Stein. And in the basketball world, it was just Alan Stein. When I made the leap over to the corporate space, alanstein.com and the different social handles were already taken. I had to add the junior just so I could get the handles and the website that I wanted. So you could have went the real Alan Stein. I could have. Had I known you back then, I probably would have done that. So yeah, up until two years ago, I never younger. went by junior. Yeah, or the, the more the more handsome Alan Stein. Yeah. That's a long that's a long handle. Then, but then, I could have done it. Then it would have been funny at Christmas with your dad. <laughs> yes, at it would, yes, it would have been. Interesting perspective. So yes, you sir. added the junior. So if if you ran into people that know you, they'd just say Coach Stein. Yes, they're not, that's what all not, of them say. They wouldn't say Coach Stein Junior. No. But it, it was do? also it was also part of the rebranding that I wanted to kind of change something about as I moved into the corporate space. Uh, my dad's a retired principal. Both oh. my both my parents were in elementary education for thirty years. Really? What well, yeah. is he still active? I mean, he's he's like, an active like, human being, but not active working. Well, no, good. he's retired. Well, I, I, I want to pick your brain right after this podcast. I've Please. got an invention that I'm going to create again. Okay. This one requires educators to help me. Okay. I think your dad could help me if he's still active and like, you know, yes. wants to do some work. And I know, not a lot of it. And I know a lot of educators, my friend. Dude, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to speak I, to I, principals associations I'm, and to schools and give graduation commitments. I'm not like, even going to, I'm you. not even going to say it on the air because it's so okay. good. People are going to do it. Got it. So okay. I'm going to do it first. I got you. Now you got a book coming out. I do. When? January 8th. January 8th, folks. I'm going to drop this episode early just to make sure it hits before January 8th. Thank or, you. Or actually, maybe we should wait till it hits so people can go get they it. They can go put it, yeah. Okay, so where can they go get it? Go to raiseyourgamebook.com. It's called mm -hmm. Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best. Raiseyourgamebook.com. Will it be on Amazon? It, it's on Amazon now. You can pre-order now, or if you want it in your hands on the 8th, you can get it. Uh, well, it might be the 8th after this drops. Perfect. Who knows? So go get his book, Raise Your Game, yes, on please. Amazon or raiseyourgamebook.com. Go follow him on, on Instagram. We'll have him back here again, I'm sure. Would love it. If you're a company or an organization and you want to freaking take your shit to the next level and get through some of the pain and agony, call Mr. Stein and, and, and see if he can help you out because too many businesses out there are afraid to invest in themselves. They, their, their scarcity mindset, they've got some money in the bank and hell no, I'm not going to give it to a consultant because then I won't have any. If you don't give it to a, someone that can help you, you might not have any anyway. Exactly. So do yourself a favor, folks let go of money sometimes because money is a tool and if you don't use it you're limiting your own ability to grow now until next time